Welcome to the Kung Fu Discussion Group. As always, I'm your Uncle Sickness. With me are the usual suspects. Yoga Midnight, how you doing today? Good. So, Mako, my man, how's it going? Uh, and good. the Magister, welcome again, joining us for the second time on the Discussion Group. So today for episode 12, we're going to talk about the keywords of Kung Fu. Keywords are um, fairly common in Northern style martial arts, especially kind of Northeast uh, Hebei, Shandong kind of areas uh, where the martial arts I've studied come from. That's why I know about the subject. So keywords, a short list of, you know, single characters to denote basic concepts and techniques. There's a bunch of different versions, uh, you know, whether you are aware of this concept or not. Uh, if you pay attention to Chinese martial arts, you've probably run across this once or twice without realizing it. Um, it's actually something pretty common in certain types of Shaw Brothers movies from the 70s. Uh, specifically, um, Dance of the Drunk Mantis, one of my favorites, the movie that inspired my website and my antics online. Um, you know, there's a scene where the main character, Foggy, has met up with um, his uncle, whose name is Sickness, interestingly enough. And they're talking about the villain of the movie, a guy named Rubber Legs. And, you know, Foggy's like, well, what about this and that? And, Sickness just kind of like very smugly is like, that guy can't beat me. Well, what do you mean? And, he, and he's just quickly throws out just a couple of like sim simple single moves or simple combinations. Like, oh, I use, you know, snatch and he does like some grabbing motions. I use claw and he does a couple of different, you know, he just real quick. It's like, those are, are like an outline of the key techniques and strategies of his martial art. That's a real thing in real, you know, real martial arts. So... We could start off with probably the easiest one. I know a lot of people are going to know about this. Um, Tang Lang Chuan, Praying Mantis. Uh, the Northern Praying Mantis comes from the Shandong area. Um, if you've ever seen uh, one of the Shaw Brothers movies with Mantis in the name, Thundering Mantis or Shaolin Mantis, you know, those are very obvious, you know, Northern Mantis. They do the hooks. He does, you know, they've got the awesome scene. Um, in Shaolin Mantis, where, you know, the main character played by David Chong is out in the woods after escaping an assassination attempt. And uh, he sees this mantis and the mantis becomes his teacher. So his training montage is like, you see him in front of a striking dummy and he's doing stuff and he doesn't really look comfortable. Camera pans over, you see the mantis. The mantis is like, tch, tch, tch. like it does a couple of things, cuts back to him and he's like, hmm. And he like tentatively does what the mantis did, like, oh, and he kind of once he seems like he gets it, he just fucking does it real fast and hard. It's a great movie, but anyway, I geeked out of it. <laughs> mantis twelve character secret. The north there's I was saying that to distinguish northern and southern praying mantis boxing um, in Chinese martial arts. Uh, the northern style comes from Shandong. Uh, it's basically rooted in the local martial arts and Taoist martial arts from uh, monasteries in the Shandong area, specifically Laoshan, Mount Lao. Uh, Southern praying mantis is kind of derived from uh, Shaolin temple uh, type styles. Uh, it's very Buddhist. You know, you see it the Hakka people um, uh, of Southern China, they still practice it. So it's basically, it's like a family style but it's also fairly widely known. Um, if you know the famous Shaw Brothers actors, the guys that played the five Venoms in Five Deadly Venoms, guy that plays Toad, his actual martial art, like he, before he was an actor, he actually studied Southern Praying Mantis. So there's a couple of his movies where you see him doing these, doing certain things. He's actually doing basic forms, uh, basic techniques from the Southern Mantis. And it doesn't look, you know, there's no, this kind of thing. It doesn't look like Northern Mantis. So. What is the, uh, what is the basic, you know, what the hands look like? Uh, they don't have a, like, they don't have like a representative hand technique the way oh, wow. Northern Mantis like does. Or Bagua's, you know, Bagua has, you know, either a pushing palm or a penetrating palm as a representative hand shape. They don't do that in the Southern style. You know, the Southern styles generally have more like, um, like they have distinctive strategies more than distinctive techniques, you know, in, in the North, um, 
people tend to have like a, like a special move, you know, instead of a skill that you've cultivated to be unusually powerful or you've cultivated unusual capability with in the North, Northern Chinese are basically built more like me, kind of long ganglier bodies than the Southerners, long limbs. There's a lot more space in the North too. So you see a lot of kicking based martial arts come from Northern China. A lot of big acrobatic, like big, the big, um, you know, the big whirling uh, kind of performance motions that you see uh, traveling actors do, you know, or, or in like Chinese opera. Those are kind of things that are much more uh, common in Northern styles because they have the space. In the South, there's a lot more, um, you know, vegetation. Uh, there's a lot more, you know, wetlands, waterways, stuff like that. People living on the coast, people living on rivers and such. So their, their styles are different. They tend to be more grounded and compact compared to the North. So I'm also not as familiar, so I can't actually say if the Southerners use keywords as well. That's something that I need to find out. Should have tried to get Jonathan Pritchard in here and we could ask him about Wing Chun. But, um, but for the North, I do know, you know, they, they do. This is a very important thing. So the... Um, Getting back to the 12 characters from Mantis. There are a few different uh, branches of Praying Mantis, as you guys may know. Um, you know, Plum Blossom Mantis, Taiji Mantis, Seven Star Mantis, Six Harmony Mantis, Eight Step Mantis. Those are basically the big ones. They all have a 12 character secret, but it's not the same 12 characters. So um, if you give me a moment, I'm having some trouble with my computer. I can't pull my, pull the blog up there, but um, I'll do it here on the, the phone. So the, uh, the key words uh, will vary. So we've got it here. Um, Taiji Mantis and Plum Blossom Mantis are basically two very closely related schools. Um, The lineage is a little bit different depending on which one you're a part of. So uh, there, those two branches have the same list of 12, uh, 12 keywords. Their, their uh, keywords are stick, adhere, assist, attach, come, call, follow, dispatch, lift, grab, seal, close. That's all, those, those are all concepts and tactics for uh, an exchange of strikes. You don't, you don't have to do the hook hand, the mantis hook hand, to perform any of those techniques correctly, to use any of those strategies. It's just about, you know, it's like in Western boxing, knowing the difference between trying to get inside somebody's guard and trying to stay outside. You know, it's basically, uh, this is, you have to be close, close enough for both of you to hit each other. This is how you do this, this is how you do that. Okay. Um, then you come to say the, the seven star mantis branches. They've got a different 12. Hook, drag, pluck, hang. Um, a different type of hook. It's a, a word, diao. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean the act of hooking somebody as a hand technique or shaping your hand like this to make a hook. Uh, that would mean if you, you know, diao would be if you shape your hand like this, you use this part to intercept or to strike somebody. So if Alex throws a, a right jab at me, I can use hook, go, to c intercept and connect to his, his strike. Then I can come in with my back hand and like a back fist or a back palm, but instead just use this huge lump of wrist, diao, right in the throat, right across the bridge of the nose, right into the temple. Like that's the kind of stuff that they would use that for. Um, it literally means something along the lines of like wicked or evil or vicious um, in the sense of like, if you do this to somebody, you're being unnecessarily vicious. Uh, but I think it gets the, um, the idea across very well. Seven Star Mantis is, is probably the hardest of the mantis substyles, they use a lot more overt hard power 
Like they're, they're, when you see a, a Mantis guy that looks like he's beating an imaginary opponent to death with just raw power, it's probably a, a seven-star guy. Um, so you probably noticed those first four, hook, drag, pluck, hang. Those are all things that you do with the representative hand uh, shape of the style. The hook, you know? The action of making your hand into a hook. That can be, you know, if I use that to attach to somebody, that would be a literal basic application of hook from this list, okay? If I do that, and then deliberately pull their hand down and toward me, that becomes um, dragging, you know? So the basic hand idea is you make your hand into a hook, you know, either with the fingers folded in, actually this might be a little easier, either fingers hold, folded in like that or tucked in like that. Some people do, again, this is like a more seven star thing this is other style, you know, but again, it depends. It depends on the person. It depends on the preference. I like to go like this uh, when I use Mantis because I prefer to keep my hands open. I like to use palms. Um, you know, again, it, it's really beneficial for someone my size to just open a hand as wide as I can and put it right in someone's field of vision like that. And then I can do other things. So, um, but anyway, these, uh, these different concepts, um, I'll, I'll read another list here. Okay, so there's uh, that list that I just read. That was specifically the Hong Kong Seven Star Mantis. If you know what the Jing Wu Association is, uh, or Ching Wu, if, if you learned about them from Bruce Lee's Chinese Connection movie. Famous martial arts school started in the early 20th century. That Jet Li movie, Fearless, is about Ho Yun Jia, the founder of Jing Wu. Uh, martial arts school, excuse me. So hook, drag, pluck, hang. Those are the first four from Hong Kong Mantis. Uh, Qingdao is a city in Shandong province up in the north. Shandong is where Northern Mantis comes from. They also use hook, drag, pluck, hang as the first four of their 12 characters. Um, the big difference is um, the, the Diao, Advance, Smash, Strike, the second four characters from the Seven Star, Hong Kong Seven Star branch. Those are, um, those are basically striking techniques. Like we just talked about using the back of the wrist to strike Diao. Well, Smash is the famous, Mantis is famous bung. Xing Yi's bung is a straight punch. Uh, Mantis's bung is a very hard back fist directly into something extremely soft, like somebody's eyeball or the tip of somebody's nose or their throat or right in the mush, like right in the mouth if you can get it. Um, How do you get the eyeball with that? Is it like by doing that? Like that you'll crush the orbital bone and probably pop their eye. In the, like it will burst in the socket or it will pop out of the socket. Either way, it's a usually fatal injury. So oh, the whole socket. Seriously? Yeah, you can put like. These knuckles, right, especially this one right here, but these two, you're basically driving that into soft tissue. So, you know, that's a very, when you're, when you're fighting a, when you're using a style that depends on um, using an aggressive strategy to overwhelm the opponent, when you get in close like Mantis does, it's basically like, Mantis can pull off mid-range, but it's actually really well suited for shorter range. You want to get in close, keep a guy literally and figuratively on the back foot, you know, his weight pushed back. You want to get him trying to get away from you. And then you just keep coming in these, these big hooks, these big back fists, hard punches directly to the, like directly to the nose, directly to the solar plexus, and then maybe pepper in some of those, you know, back of the hook hand type strikes. Again, soft spots, the neck, putting the forearm across the neck or the throat, putting the, um, this back of the wrist right into the, um, right into the collarbone, things like that. Um, Mantis will literally break somebody into pieces in beating them. Seven star more so than the other styles. 
So you see there, the Hong Kong version, they've got some basic ideas. Yeah, you want to use a lot of trapping and controlling, hooking type derived motions. Um, the last four characters, stick it here, attach, lean. Those are all close contact um, ideas. So once you've punched me and I've intercepted you, or vice versa, I try to punch you and you intercept me. We are literally touching each other. Then from there, obviously sticking it here, those are obvious. Make contact, keep contact. Attaching is a, a very particular Mantis thing. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Mantis's basic posture, Xing Yi has sand t-shirt, um, you know, uh, Bagua has the, you know, turning posture, millstone posture, they call it sometimes. Uh, Mantis's representative posture is the Mantis catches a cicada. It's basically um, like the same sort of stance as, as Santi Cher, a kind of a 60-40 middle stance, or it's a false stance. So the front foot is completely unweighted and the hands kind of do, you know, just like a normal, like, like Bagua does something like this, the triangle hands, you do the same thing, but Mantis hooks. So attaching would be if I'm using my left hand as my lead, you strike at me. I get the wrist with my lead hand. Then I take a step forward and come around. As my back hand becomes the front hand, I take control of the elbow right here specifically. So is that like uh, sticking and singing? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, it's, um, it emphasizes seizing control of the enemy's limb and maintaining that control more so than Xing. Xing Yi wants to stick so that you can guarantee, I guarantee that I am now close enough to use this devastating short range technique that you won't be able to see because it's coming from down by the waist. The Mantis idea is I want to get, a I want to get control of your arm and then continually put it in between you and me. So even though I only have one arm, say the left arm, you can't use the right arm because I'm staying outside of its range, you know? I can do this casually because there's nobody fucking around with me, but, you know, as you know yourselves from sparring and practicing, if somebody's really pressing you, they're kind of lightly slapping you up, you're not throwing some weird, you know, behind that, you're not doing that. You're not throwing some weirdo punch. So it's a very effective technique for, um, keeping somebody in their own way, you know? Uh, Bob Wajang calls this uh, connect to one, but solve two problems, basically. Um, now, the reason I just did all that, I, I went into that, is that's, that's what these two seven-star branches have in common, the first four and the last four. I mentioned the middle four, Diao, Advance, Smash, Strike. Striking, again, is literally any kind of punch. Smash is specifically the backhand. Um, advancing is like advancing in any other martial art. You take a step forward, you know, you move, you know, you change which is the lead side on a guard or specifically a Chinese type of concept. You've got your guard up. I break your guard and get inside. I've entered your guard. So that's a good example of how these these keyword lists can be either a list of techniques or a list of concepts or a list of strategies. You know, smashing bung for Mantis is a technique. It is literally a specific type of backhand, not a horizontal backhand, a very vertical rolling backhand that comes right out from, you know, you can't see my hands right now because of how I'm sitting. It comes up out of nowhere. You just see this, you know, you see this fist when it hits you in the face, basically. But these other concepts, you know, uh, advance. Advance is literally a concept. It's not a technique. You can't call, you know, if, if just taking a step forward is a martial arts technique, then everybody on this planet is a martial artist, right? So now that I've talked myself in five different circles, we're finally going to get to the Qingdao, the, you know, home base seven star mantis the four characters that they have different from the hong kong seven star mantis uh instead of 
Diao, Advance, Smash, and Strike, they have Smash, Chop, Raise, and Thrust. So they still keep that technique. They're still putting in basically, um, you know, eight concepts and four techniques here. Um, but the difference is um, to really emphasize uh, sort of the flavor of Qingdao Seven Star Mantis's preferences for attack. So the Hong Kong Mantis, they're talking more about, you know, closing distance, making contact, you know, set up your strike, finish your strike. The Qingdao Seven Star people, their emphasis is more on, uh, you know, close the distance, make contact, here are your options for striking. You know, everybody, we just talked about Bung, right. Another big mantis technique is just a straight up chop, like a chopping palm or a chopping fist, the sort of, you know, basic, just like a straight punch is a basic martial arts technique, vertical chop is a basic. Mantis literally puts those two together. So you can get this, this bung comes this way, and then the other hand comes over and chops. You get that continuous, like a windmill type of effect. In Mantis, that's called uh, Fan Che Lulu. Fan Che is Chinese for a water wheel. Lulu is, um, you know, a windlass that you use for a pulley system. So those ideas, using both arms together is like turning a water wheel. I can continuously roll over you with a continuous smashing, bashing, chopping, crushing type of, of attack. It's two, two limbs functioning as one to attack. Windless, the Lulu is, you use one hand to do that kind of stuff. So instead of coming over with both for big windmills, I would do one little, you know, like, use one hand to intercept, kind of deflect you, and then come back and strike with the same hand. It's that idea. So that works. All right, before I keep rambling like this, questions so far, comments so far. So uh, just some quick comments with respect to what you said about um, hooking, capturing the arm and putting it in between mm -hmm. and then staying on the outside. So the control of the arm, is it just like a physics-based control or is it, is it attacking a nerve cluster in the elbow? On the, on the most basic level, it's just physics excuse me, just mechanics. You're just getting hold of an arm and preventing it being used against you as a tool. Uh, when you get a little more experience, the way that you connect, is, especially with when, uh, when the hands exchange places and the former rear hand comes up to take control of the elbow, yes. if you know where those nerve, uh, if you know where the nerve clusters are, in yeah. the elbow, across the bicep, and uh, here in the medius part of the forearm, you can yes. take control of those and strike those as well. If you know enough, if you're, if you're good enough at wrist locks, like Dr. Young, my, my teacher, um, the guy that I learned Tai Chi Chuan meditation and, you know, uh, joint locks from, he could come in and with the hook, get you in a wrist lock, like yeah. a small wrap hand with just the one hand. So you could conceivably attach just to take away one of the opponent's options or you could attach in a way that is also a lock or also joint damage, you know? And then you can, that can be your main attack or that can be another sort of um, way of setting up options, you know? Because okay. again, with, with joint locks, if your technique is under a certain level of proficiency, people can muscle out of it. Yes. If somebody, if the person you're trying to lock is double jointed, they can yeah, muscle think, out of it. If they're extremely double jointed, they can really muscle out of it and turn it on, turn it around on you and put you in a bad position. Yeah. So you can do that as a as like a setup. It'll distract and then that and then you backhand on the wrist can just come over the top and strike again. Come over the top and strike again. Come around from the side and strike again. Strike again. You can also, you know, use the these fingers from Mantis. Yep. Use this one. Um They've got uh, a couple of techniques that they used to talk about, pulling the pin out or putting a pin in. It's basically, you know, pulling a pin out would be, I'm going to reach up, grab you by the ear, and pull it off your fucking head. Yeah. 
putting one in is I'm going to put this in your eye. I'm going to put this in your Adam's apple. I'm going to put this in, I'm not going to say exactly where it is, but there's a delicious little spot where the, uh, the neck, the traps and um, the top of the chest all come together where you can get uh, a major nerve and uh, a blood vessel. And if you do at the right angle, it can kind of give them the impression that you're closing the windpipe from the side a little bit. But you're not supposed to show people how to choke other people out. <laughs> we were finished recording. <laughs> well, I think that, that, that was helpful. And before I go into my next question, yeah. so Mantis, so Mantis hand or Mantis hook, you, things, things like that. So we know specific conditioning for like hollow hands, specific conditioning typically in karate for fingers, just uh, let's say finger push-ups. But I know from studying like stick techniques mm -hmm. that some there are maybe like hidden conditioning techniques. So are there any sort of conditioning techniques specific for Mantis hand? Yeah, they use a lot of... Um... So they kind of, they approach it from two different directions. You know, the obvious one is you want to condition the fingers and the hands to be able to deliver these strikes. You know, I want to be able to throw a punch that's going to hurt another guy. Okay, that's easy. Yes. But that's the other end of that is no matter how strong you are, there's a certain amount of force if your mechanics aren't perfect that's going to rebound back into your body. So the second phase of conditioning would be conditioning yourself to withstand the amount of power that you can generate. So even if there, even if you have perfect mechanics and you never cause a rebound on yourself, that's fine for demonstration. But there are going to be instances in a real fight, in a real situation, where you're not going to be able to use a perfectly aligned, mechanically perfect execution of a technique. So you have to be conditioned for a rebound no matter what. You know, I had a period of time where... Um, before I was sick, all I really did to train with other people was I would basically just go like this and let people hit me in the abdomen so that I could develop my dantian. Um, that's, that's sort of something that a lot of people neglect. So that's, like, that's a great question. Specifically for Mantis, one thing to use is, um, uh, do you guys know uh, uh, a guy on Twitter? Um, he posts a lot about... Um, you know, using LinkedIn to its fullest potential and that kind of stuff, like business consulting, a uh, guy named uh, Shadid. Um, I want to say, it's like, he, a lot of people call him Mr. Shadid. He's a black guy about my age, maybe a little bit older. Um, a lot of jujitsu. He's got a jujitsu background, I believe. All that stuff that I've posted over the last couple of months about using the rice bucket for grip yes. training and training. Yes. That, what this, what he's talking about there, that is exactly the kind of stuff you want to do. You get a bucket, okay. fill it yeah. with rice, and you just go in and you do different stuff. Like you, you reach right in, grab, squeeze, release, pull it out, drive it yeah. in, grab, that kind of stuff. Basically, you condition, right the skin, you condition the joints. So that's a way like, you know, I, I gave a kid, I've worked security my entire adult life. Uh, I had to uh, chase somebody at one job, I was very angry because he made me chase him. And when I caught up, I didn't grab him. I gave him uh, Bagua's probing palm. I jammed my fingers like this directly into, you know, that spot where the neck meets the top of the back to knock him down. Uh, you, you can't really tell, but I inadvertently dislocated this finger on two joints from doing it because I, I wasn't prepared for the rebound. I had only ever paid attention to how much force I could put out. I didn't pay attention to what my force would do to my body. You know, it's easy to miss that when you're only hitting people. When you hit something more solid than a human body, like a rock or a wall or something like that, you find out real fast what, whether or not you are capable of withstanding your own force. How do you yeah. get the rebound? Versus how do you the what? Is the conditioning for the rebound separate from like conditioning the, you know, so I can, I can imagine the rice thing for conditioning the hands and the fingers. Yeah, that'll get you on the rebound too. That'll cover both. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, it'll, it'll condition you for putting out force. It'll condition you for receiving force through those joints. Um, one way that Mantis does this in general is they have uh, 
like the beating method or a slapping method. They have a couple of different names for it, but it's basically like, like I described, you stand there and then the teacher comes up and he literally slaps the shit out of you. Just, you know, one hand on the back, bam, bam, wailing on the chest, wailing on the abdomen, wailing on the, like the, the kind of pelvic area right over the bladder, right over the solar plexus, up here on the chest, very close to the throat, slapping you in the side of the head, top of the head, over the back. Like they will literally use the power they've accumulated over the years to help you develop the ability to withstand a blow. And I'm going to say, honestly, I like that better than sort of the uh, more widely spread traditional way. Dr. Yang said it best. What you would do is the teacher would tie you up and then beat you with a stick. Yep. So you wouldn't be able to get away or block. You would just be taking shots over and over again. That's how you condition. That's how you condition yourself to withstand a punch. You take the punch. So again, why are traditional like Western boxers, MMA guys, why are they making our type of traditional martial artists look like idiots? Not enough of us are punching each other in the face. Yeah. A boxer is always going to win over anybody, anybody, because he takes punches, he gives punches to the face, to the body, whatever. And what are we doing? Most of us are out there in fucking sequined pajamas. You know, what was that joke? Oh, where's my chi? I can't find my chi. <laughs> no wasting everybody's time so the, these are things and see how the we're just talking about keywords brought us into more complex complex aspects of conditioning this is the real benefit of the keywords and an oral instruction teaching model when it's oral instruction even in a situation like this you three guys could be in the same room as me I could be given a speech and you guys only listen. It's still, I'm teaching you something different, you something different, you something different. You're all getting something tailor fit to you personally. Um, you know, writing books, video material, all that stuff. It's great for getting the stuff out there, but for a raw beginner, like somebody that's never trained in martial arts before, wasn't really athletic, never been in a fight, they're not gonna be able to succeed with just that, you know, they yeah. need that personalized touch. They need a more experienced person to explain to them, right, you know, this style specializes in this, but you, don't. actually, you know what? Here's a really great story that actually ties right into Mantis. So one of the sub-styles we haven't discussed yet is called Six Harmony Mantis. Uh, so there's a famous style in uh, Northern China called Lu He Chuan, Six Harmony uh, Boxing. Basically, a Mantis guy and a Six Harmony guy became friends. So they exchanged techniques with each other. The Six Harmony guy uh, learned these basic Mantis tactics and strikes, combined it with everything that he already knew from Six Harmony boxing, made the Six Harmony Mantis. So there, right, let me pull this up. Again, they're, they're 12 characters, completely different from anything we've already mentioned. Um, it's a completely different set of strategies and tactics. It's still a Northern Mantis variant with the same technical and kind of like philosophical foundation as the other branches, but they don't do this in Six Harmony Mantis. They do, they kind of have this like, it's very distinct. I'm not sure I can describe it, but, you know, once you see it and you know what you're looking at, you, you recognize it. You know, they use, um, okay, their first four for their 12 keywords, hook, hang, saw, and file. So right off the bat, they're, they're, they're getting rid of two core concepts that rely on this hand shape and substituting them with two other concepts that you can basically use an open hand on. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is the Six Harmony man that uh, did this exchange with the, the Mantis guys, um, he had a student who had a deformity in one of his hands. Um, like, he basically had webbed fingers 
and fused joints on one hand. So he couldn't make a fist with one hand. The best he could do was this. This kind of, you know, it's not anything like what we were doing before talking about the hook. You see the mantis hook looks like this. This guy was doing this, you know? And somebody described it as it looks like, you know, a duck is doing like a floppy foot walk. So they called him Duck Palm. Duck Palm Wei Sin was his name. This guy took a literal handicap and adapted it into the, um, the strategy of the style. And he improved the style because he got so good at using his limitation as an advantage. So that's a great example of taking something that's pretty well defined, taking a guy who for all intents and purposes is not physically capable of this style, but teaching him to use this style anyway, and to have him be better than a, than a normal person with normal hands. That's the, again, something that I really like about Chinese martial arts is the, the self-cultivation, you know? I've never learned, I didn't, I didn't meet another, I didn't learn from a teacher who was the same size as me until I started um, studying yin style Bagua. He Jin Bao and Matt Build, those guys, Alex, you probably remember them. They're about my height, six footers, you know? Before that, all of my teachers, uh, six inches to a full foot shorter than me. You know, Ty, my classmate down at YMAA, who was my Xing Yi teacher, that guy is like five foot six. He's like eight inches shorter than I am. My Xing Yi and his Xing Yi come from the same place, but I don't look like him at all. And I'm not talking about appearance, you know? I can afford to do things that he can't do. He can do things that I physically am not capable of. Even before all this shit, when I was in perfect health at my maximum flexibility or whatever, this guy can get lower than I ever could. It's just, but he was able to tailor Xing Yi to my size and my strengths and my preferences in a certain way because I'm a lot less aggressive than you would think somebody my size uh, would be. You know, I like to play it safe a little bit. Uh, so anyway, it worked out really well in my favor. Um, back to the, the Mantis 12 characters. Um, so I think this is all pretty, pretty clear. You know, you've got the, uh, the Seven Star and Plum Blossom and Taiji Mantis branches. They're, they, are, they are focused on a very particular type of fighting. Mid to short range, I want to use some grappling to control you, get in, hard heavy strikes, beat a guy down, dominate and win. That's their strategy. You see, Six Harmony Mantis has kind of a similar idea, but instead of pound a guy down, beat a guy down, it's more of a little more finesse to it, you know? It's, it's cutting somebody's ankle tendon instead of bashing them in the head with a rock. Like, that's a decent way to simplify, but it's a decent way to kind of explain these differences. Then we get another branch, Eight Step Mantis. Eight Step Mantis is... Um, so there was a, a, I mentioned earlier how uh, Taiji and Plum Blossom Mantis are basically two different, two sides of the same coin. One of the famous individuals uh, from their lineage, it's a guy uh, they called the first Mantis King. He was like one of the first people to have the nickname, like oh, the King of Mantis Boxers or whatever. This guy uh, later in life, he readjusted, um, you know, when he got into his 50s, he changed what he had learned, a very aggressive, athletic, physically intense and demanding type of mantis, combined it with, uh, you know, Tai Chi Chuan type body methods, Bagua footwork, Xing Yi power generation, uh, and, and a couple other things from a couple other styles. And he made a whole new version of mantis later in his life called Eight Step Mantis. So he learned in the Plum Blossom Tai Chi Mantis line. He was the head of, of that line for most of his life. Um, and he changed his personal style from that kind of crash and bash, get in fast, take, you know, seize control, beat him down type of strategy to what eight-step mantis became. Instead of me using speed 
and power to overwhelm you, I'm going to use finesse, uh, receptivity, sensitivity, body method, footwork. You know, I don't have to beat you to death. I can run circles around you. Um, so it's again a 12 character secret, but instead of anything to do with hand techniques or concepts of fist, like literal fist fighting, literal boxing, these 12 are all body method and footwork. Dodge, turn, clear, shift, lean, support, attach, close, diao, uh, strike, seize, grab. And seize and grab, those last two, that's chin na, so literally joint locks. He went from a style that emphasized, I'm going to grab you so I can punch you to death, to I'm going to touch you so I can lock you up and prevent you from fighting back. And this is just one guy over the course of his life. So he completely changed his approach, changed his personal ways of training, his personal uh, style of fight, like his actual way that he fought, changed it completely, started teaching people that too. So you can, you can have, you can tailor more than one martial art to fit a person, just like you can have more than one suit that fits you well. Um, because obviously, you know, my primary martial art is Xing Yi, using myself as an example. I'm a big guy. Xing Yi is a short range style. I use Xing Yi to defend myself from smaller people. Bagua has no range and emphasizes mobility. Great. I've got really, really long arms and really long legs. So I don't use Bagua to avoid people. I use Bagua to stand out of range of your strikes and then just, you know, kind of close. I do like a close and a lid motion on a lot of people, especially if they're shorter than me. Get that clap right in the head. Mm, I love that. Uh, learned that from wrestling with dogs. But anyway, besides that. So as you can see, you can have one style with um, any number of variations, you know, and the, the differences between those, those branches, they're not, they're not very big, you know? Like I said, Taiji Mantis and Plum Blossom Mantis are basically the exact same style. It's just in your lineage chart in the back, it says, you know, Joe Smith was the fifth master of the style. And, you know, you know, Joe Johnson was the, the sixth master. Well, you can also, it's confusing. But basically, the guy that I just mentioned that created Eight Step, guy named Jong, they called him the Mantis King. Um, they, he had a, a close friend, like his best buddy that he trained with all the time, his childhood friend. They both learned from the same teacher. Zhang was named the successor. When Zhang wanted to retire, instead of him naming one of his students his successor, he named his homeboy, a guy named Song, his successor. So in... Um, in, uh, and I forget which is which. One of them, it used to be Taiji Plum Blossom Mantis. After this, one of them used Taiji to demonstrate, like to designate their, their branch, and the other used Plum Blossom to, to designate their branch. So say in Plum Blossom, you've got Zhang as Master 5 and Song as Master 6. But in, in the other one, you've got Song as five and Jong as six. So. I don't know why that took so long. I apologize for that, guys. But you see how this there's there's all sorts of things that can be like tied up in this. And you know, it's just a list of words. Maybe a short list, maybe a long list, but it's not just the martial arts, it's the philosophy, the style can be transmitted this way. Aspects of the actual literal history of the style can be transmitted this way. Hey, can I say something? Sure, sure. So like on the, uh, so uh, something that I've been working on lately is I'm uh, trying to like figure out mind mapping. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna get too into it, but, but basically the text was saying how, it's essentially saying that that's how people remember. And like, it's like when you fill a page of notes, 
it's like you're not going to remember 90 percent of that where like we're really how the mind works is those keywords it's it's the root of association that that all the complexity can be you know tacked yeah. on so um like so i think like so the keyword system um it's it just mirrors how the brain works and and it's also partly part of the brilliance of all these like uh martial and philosophical concepts that are like packed together you know yeah. that's like that's how people can remember so you remember that thing and then later on you can start to pull the mold out exactly yeah exactly like uh books and videos those are great ways to record uh things they're great for storage but if that's the only way it, you have to to teach new generations of students it's not going to be long before the actual efficacy of the style is just completely gone look now you know we've where we are living in the era of highly respected masters of traditional martial arts guys that have been you know considered the best for decades getting knocked out by amateur mma dudes and not even like putting up a fight just straight up ref says go they approach each other one hit and the master goes down like you know when all you have is the book all you have is the form you're gonna lose the skills you know it's uh it's a shame that it has to be like that but the positive side is it's real easy to get that skill back all you have to do is start fighting again so it it's not like it's impossible i just i personally don't ever want to lose the martial aspect of martial arts because you know despite what my mom likes to tell people i am not really that creative or artistic a person you know no one's ever going to buy a painting i made or a sculpture i made the most artistic thing i'm going to be able to do is move in a way that is going to tell anybody watching exactly who i am and exactly what i'm about so um, yeah yeah uh, uh, my other teacher, Martin, had mentioned this. I, I think what you were talking about with the Dantian training, mm -hmm. uh, there's this, this term, Pong. Is that, is that correct? That Because that, 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 uh, one of my, my other teacher, he had another student who had worked as a construction worker, and he said that somehow that work had engendered Pong, like that sort of, you know, yeah. you, it, it kind of hits back a little bit. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, aside from being tied up and like hit all, like, so ideally you'd get hit up, like hit all over the place. To develop it. You literally get beaten with a rod do until you, getting hit with things doesn't hurt anymore. Do you think that um, that kind of attention to the Dantian may be like the most pragmatic, like inroad, like like Bruce Lee with the medicine ball, like yeah. somebody from the medicine ball at the, at the yeah, cat? yeah. Because I mean, you can do it on your own. I did it on my own for years, but I didn't really start to see rapid development in that area until I turned to one of my boys one day and was like, hey, can you help me out? I want to see if I can do something. I need you to punch me exactly in this spot. And I indicated where. And when he hit me, it was like, it was like trying to punch a basketball. Yeah. You know, his hand just, whoa, yeah. wow. And he was like, did you do that on purpose? Oh, yeah, this and that. And we had this great exchange. And it got everybody else trying to develop this skill. But we found the only really way, like the only way to make progress that's going to satisfy the average person is you develop the ability to withstand a punch to that spot by having somebody punch you in that spot over and over and over again for real. What do you think is like the safest way of doing that without, uh, like, um, you know, like without getting your nose broke or something like that? You know what I mean? Like, like how do people? Right, it's just <laughs> yeah, no, you're not going to. The only the only way to know the only way to learn how to continue fighting when you've been punched in the nose potentially getting it broken is to get fucking punched in the nose in the middle of a sparring session and not be allowed to stop sure. like again why do boxers have so much on us you punch a guy that's been boxing for two years in the nose he's gonna go like this and then try to punch you back with most traditional martial artists you punch them in the nose you know you spend the rest of the afternoon talking to the cops so uh, i think to 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 your to your point, Uncle, it's it's really yeah. There's there seems to be no other way apart from getting punched. Like I I know everybody that we spar together. It's not even 
face shots because face shots is one of the first things that we we sort of tend to overcome psychologically yeah as well as physically yeah it it's it's this this spot over here right it's yeah. uh the sternum solar plexus shots it used to put a lot of people down but after a couple of months of training they could get hit with a shot that put them down two three months ago yeah. and they literally could walk, walk it off like still be sparring, still be moving, maintain composure. Yeah. I do know that in bow training, one thing that some bow forms do is as you do the strike, the other end of the bow actually comes around and strikes the body. Yeah. And you are able to control how hard it strikes the body by how hard you actually swing the bow. So it's sort of like the self-paced body shot. Now it's mostly to the yeah, all the way down, floating ribs, main ribs, yeah. more to the more to the sides of the body, but it does help significantly. In the 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 purpose, as it was explained when I was being taught the form, was part of it is just conditioning. It's not just about knowing the form, but also conditioning yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and that's usually where people don't want to learn staff techniques anymore. Is when you get to that part about it. Now we're gonna hit you with the staff. Right? How do you how do you maintain your grip when someone's whacked you on the knuckles? I don't know, teacher. How? Hold your staff up. That's true. Are you talking? So you're saying you're talking about a specific tool for that kind of a training? Yeah, uh, specifically. Like, yeah, if you want to learn how to retain a weapon, try yeah. to somebody attack your hand and try to disarm you. I'm saying so. Yeah. What, what the, the, the bow, you're saying like the bow. You're just talking about bow staff, like a you know, like a stick, just like a regular, yeah, just a regular, you know, like the whatever, like a six foot or average size pole, basically. Yeah, as you come yeah. around, you, you know, those big windmill motions that people like, you know, they look real cool and they make that noise. Yeah, that looks real cool up here. But if you do it down here, there's actually a reason to do it. Yeah, the the interesting that you mentioned that again, you know, one of the things that we do, we haven't, we do it maybe once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. is we all sort of huddle together, we grab our bow sticks, and it becomes a bow grappling session. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is use the bow to detach your bow. And yes, we are allowed to <laughs> do various things to your knuckles. Yes, exactly. Press that's, that's the, the bow against the knuckle in between and squeeze. Yeah. Just in order to teach uh, bow retention, bow retention skills. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's when technique sort of goes away and it becomes a question of, okay, do I really want to hold on to this bow or not? Because it's optional and it's a, a it's an elimination style. So you drop your bow, next person jumps in until it gets back around to you. So you can quit anytime you want. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I actually really like that. And I think I'm going to steal that idea. Whoever, I shouldn't say this, but these poor bastards in Columbus, whoever starts paying me to learn Kung Fu is going to get their fucking ass kicked. It's going to be great. I mean, I'm probably going to get bruised up too, but, you know, as a dignified security pro uh, professional, I won't let any bruises happen above here. I'll just keep them all on the torso so nobody knows. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this I stuff... I volunteer as a test subject. Hey, that's fine. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you need to learn firsthand. And I don't mean it to sound as sinister as it probably does, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of things that I want to learn firsthand because I, there's there's no one around here in like the sticks that I can I can do this with. And I have plenty of trees that I can hit out here, but there's no. Like, yeah. You know. One of my favorite things, uh, an actual Xing Yi conditioning drill. You have to hold your arm out, hold it to the side, hold it to the front, wherever. You just hold your arm out. You give me an arm. And then I'm going to stand so that that forearm is just perfectly horizontal in front of me. And I'm going to take my forearm, especially this part right here. This part right here, where no matter how much muscle you have, it's basically a bone blade sticking out of your forearm. And then you just bash and you bash and you bash. And I'm misleading <laughs> you because I'm making it look like it's only this kind of bash. But really, it's... I'm going to use, you know, I weigh 240 pounds now. I'm going to put 240 pounds minimum into a half inch spot on your forearm with the boniest part of my arm. You do that over and over again. That's how you condition uh, contact for Xing Yi. Well, str yeah. strangely enough, that specific strike that you just showed yeah. using the forearm, I'm, co I'm coming with it with like gravity and turning. Mm -hmm. I, that's what I've been 
that's what I've been learning for the past two weeks. <laughs> right. It's fun, isn't it? Once you get the net, like there's a, there's a, a point where you feel it and you start to realize other ways you can use, not just that body weapon, but this kind of idea, right. I'm going to hit you, but I'm not going to try to hurt you. I want you to stop paying attention to our fight and start paying attention to that one spot. That's the best thing about it. Cause you, you know, if they're weak, great. You've got somebody standing there holding their arm, letting you do whatever you want. If they're strong, they're probably going to go. And then you can do whatever you want. If you're really unlucky, then they're one of those monsters where you do that and then it hurts you and not them. And they just, fucking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> grab a guy by the head and just sort of pick him up by his face. <laughs> they did the North Star crushing the head. Like, yeah, right? Turn around, you're already dead. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I do have a question, Uncle. So with respect to building one's resistance against others' punches, is it the same training that one does to build resistance against one's own rebound? Yeah. Yeah, it okay. literally is. Because that's, that's essentially, um, especially... When you start getting into a, a style that wants to use specific mechanical methodologies to generate power, you have to, you, that's, this is, it's not optional to skip the conditioning part. You know, you don't necessarily need to be doing road work like a pro fighter. You know, you don't need to be running 10 miles a day or whatever, but you know, it's a different type of conditioning. Like we said, not cardio conditioning. That's what most people default to. This is a uh, strike resistance conditioning. So a Xing Yi way to do this, um, which I know Matt and Alex will recognize very easily. You know, a Santee shirt type motion. You go from uh, like the double pushing hands of the tiger shape. Yes, sir. You bring the hands back like this to reset. Or if you do it with one hand for a normal technique, you do this in a fight, but to condition yourself, and this is what I did, you can do this. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're pounding. You got to get different angles, different levels of force, different directions. Ooh. For somebody whose abdomen has been as fucked up as mine has been for a decade, I that did that. not hurt at all. Like it should have hurt and it didn't. <laughs> I'm going to check real quick just because I'm paranoid about it. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Oh my god. No blood. It felt weird though. I'd never I've never punched uh a really thick scar before. So I just punched my own really thick scar in my abdomen. It's like ooh shit. I'd say you guys gotta feel this, but I don't want anybody to punch me in the stomach until I'm absolutely ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this like that kind of thing. You can turn different motions into conditioning, keeping it in a Xing Yi sense. So I did the this type of motion. All right, yeah. that's a single rising hand to set up, you know, stepping forward to strike. You can do that, bring one hand up, or you can bring two hands up, and then the back hand. You really emphasize, this is called uh, passing, is this motion. But you pass because it, it adds an isometric mm. resistance element to the motion. So you get to feel this hand that's the back hand that's going to become the front hand. You feel it pressing the front hand down. You feel the front hand pulling the back right. hand back. And then the contact between them you get that friction, that uh, filing action. It is specifically, when, I, when you do this, what I'm talking about, when you do this to yourself to train, it's passing. When we make contact and I do that to you to distract or injure uh, the point of contact, that's filing. Just, just like it sounds. You take a file, you grind it down. You rub it across. Yeah, but instead of a rock or something wood or whatever, I'm doing that to your skin. It's basically, if you remember being a kid, a friction burn, Indian rubs, it's basically that. You are literally doing friction burns in a fight. It's a great technique too. It works really well. So, 
Um, any other questions? I can move into the next list uh, if you guys want to keep going, or we can kind of wrap this up. Um, I'm not sure how long we've been recording. I think about an hour and a half. So, questions, thoughts, comments? Well, anyway? um, so I have a question and then a comment. Oh, do you want to go for yoga? Oh no, I was I was just gonna say I'm, I'm gonna like I want to like eat soon. So, but but I but I I um, you know I want to participate too. So, uh, okay. So I don't actually have a question. I mean, but. Any, okay. Anybody? Tommy, you had a question? So I have a question. Uh, and then after the question, I do have a comment about uh, energy rebounding. Yeah. So my question is, when you, say, you said, so you just explained filing. You've explained uh, striking before, and you've explained uh, that particular strike. Uh, Dao, is that what you called it? Yeah, yeah when you use like the, the, the back backhand. of the wrist. Yeah, that was a yeah, mantis. Yeah. Now, I, I, there's a term you used for one of the Mantis uh, characters. You said crushing. Yeah. Could you describe what that is, please? That's the heavy back fist that I was talking about. That's a a very vertical, fist. like a, it's, it's got a very heavy rolling element to it, you know? You can show, okay. there's that, you know, Bruce Lee movie back yes. fist. That's how most yeah. people do it. It's like a fist moving independently of a body and the arm is just a string connecting the two that's yes. how it looks in the movies that's not the sort of back fist that uh mantis I knew. yeah mantis is it's it's bung uh the same character um in taiji chuan it can mean crushing collapsing um bursting like those kind of ideas the idea is um the image you should get from mantis's bung uh, it's Bung Chui in Mantis, uh, C-H-U-I, Chui, gen it literally means hammers, but colloquially it's like punches or, or like, you know, okay. uh, so you talk about like different punches in, in like Western boxing, you would talk about different hammers okay. in some parts okay. of China. So this, this, what you're going for is it, it's literally like if you took a sledgehammer and just hit kind of a plaster cast statue right, yeah. right between the eyes with the hammer. What would that do to the head of the statue? That's what you want to do to somebody when you give, this, give them this technique. That's what it should be. There are a couple of variations, like instead of being perfectly vertical, when you land the strike, you can come in slightly on an angle. Or you can aim past their head and then really use the forearm to get the neck, the, the uh, arteries, uh, stuff like that. So you have different variations. And when you do come in diagonally like that or shoot past their head, it can roll into those other forearm contact uh, techniques that uh, Mantis really likes. So it's not just coming in to use these hooks to get in your face and bash you with this or bash you with this. I can also come in, let you, you know, you kind of get, you, you kind of get them thinking um, closer is safer. You know, an experienced fighter, I've said this a lot, but an experienced fighter knows if you want to avoid getting knocked out, you get closer to the enemy. You don't go further away. If it's a situation where a normal sized person is fighting somebody my size, going further away is putting yourself in my kill zone. Coming closer is the only way you're going to avoid it. Um, you know, so uh, Mantis... Uh, the northern mantis specifically, like especially, wants to get people thinking, right, if I, if I get in close, he won't be able to rain those windmills down on me. So you get in close mm. and you do something dumb like leave this forearm really close to your neck or leave this elbow really close to your floating rib. And great, now you're not getting hammered in the nose, but you're getting, you know, you're getting moved, you're getting pressed, you're getting folded up and squeezed, you know, this hand will come around, get the throat, get one hand to the, you know, you know what I'm, I'm being a little nebulous and vague, but the idea, the idea is to um, use these inadvertent conditioning motions that are built into the choreography of a style to build yourself up so that you don't fall victim to this. But now you also have an awareness of, you know, 
It only takes this much force to this specific spot to make a really tall, strong, whatever, you know, somebody conditioned to fight expecting to be hit can be completely overwhelmed by a relatively small amount of force if you put it in the right place, you know? I don't need to be able to crush a brick if I can get away with just thumbing you right in the eye first. You won't be able to defend yourself, you know? I don't need to be able to, to you know, parry a thousand punches in a split second if I can kick you in the balls before you can throw that first punch. So sometimes a little bit can be more. These conditioning motions, um, these sort of using yourself as training equipment to train yourself types of concepts, you can figure out all sorts of, you know, secondary and tertiary level applications that a teacher may not volunteer to you. You know, most teachers nowadays will give away the, the basic applications. This motion is a straight punch. This motion is a vertical chop. It, it, that is what it is. But they won't tell you, yeah, in this motion, there's hidden using your elbow, bending your elbow and using that to get in. In this motion, there's hidden making contact with another person's arm and using the motion of striking to take that bone we were just talking about and file right across there. Bone on bone hurts most people. So if you've been doing bone on bone conditioning to get yourself used to that, it's not gonna mean anything when you just rub that right across, you know, rub your forearm right across the top of their forearm. Or again, the mantis, I mean, the shingy conditioning I mentioned earlier to Alex threateningly, bashing the forearm like this, right. I can do that and knock a weapon out of somebody's hand because it doesn't hurt me to put full on bone on bone in, in that spot. I'm ready for that. So that's an extra technique that I get to have. You can, you can, we can all do that with our styles. You know, you see, um, as a, as an example for like, uh, karate styles that have Sanchin kata, you can do Sanchin yeah. just as like a structural exercise, or you can do it as a, a choreographed shadow boxing fight. You know, there are styles in China where they, in Southern China, they only do a version of Sanchin with this like, it's, it's not, it looks exactly the same, but you don't see that tension or that power that you see in the Japanese version because they're all about setting up flowing one technique into another or something. But it's literally the same choreography and the same basic structure. They just choose to emphasize a different type of application of power. The Japanese use it, you know, you see the Japanese, basically some of them use it for isometrics, some of them use it for conditioning, and then some people actually use it, you know, literally use it. But for the most part, it's a tool. But it's a tool that can give you extra techniques that you don't need, you know. If you pay attention to this tool, you realize, oh, this, I can do 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 these extra things. It's not just about, you know, controlling your breathing. It's not just about shoring up your stance. I can also do this. I can do that, you know? When you've got really strong, stable structure, um, really, really well-developed, firmly, deeply rooted stances, like you get from practicing the Sanchen Kata, you can start using those stances to fuck with other people's stances. You know? The, you've seen in, in uh, I mean, we've all seen in some martial arts movies, It'll cut down and you see these two guys, basically they're exchanging leg techniques, trips and kicks and low, you know, low hooks and stuff, exactly as intricate, intricate and all that as the hand techniques they exchange. So you see this flurry of punches up high and then you go down low and you see these battle, the leg, like, how do they get that? They built up their stances, a real, like as a real application, not just movie magical stuff. You can really learn to do that. You can get stances so solid that if you're, if your knee and my knee touch, you're going to go down. There was a period in my life where I could guarantee that anybody that, whose legs touched mine was going to fall because I would make them fall. I can't do that anymore. My stances aren't back yet, but you can do it. And it doesn't take, just like I said, with the um, getting that basketball effect in the lower abdomen, it doesn't take as long as you may think to develop those kinds of skills. The hardest part is getting the physical strength. Then you just get to do like what Tommy was saying. 
you play a game, make it a game. We're all going to no, no arms, you know, like we don't use hands on this. We're just going to cross the legs either at the, at the uh, calf below the knee or directly at the knee. And we're going to try and bump each other to knock each other down. Again, keywords. Taiji Chuan's 13 patterns. Five of them are hand techniques. Uh, no, sorry. Eight of them are hand techniques. Five of them are footwork techniques. One of the footwork techniques is literally like, what is the application of central equilibrium? It's having a stance that's stable enough that you can use it to, un to destabilize another person's stance. Did that make sense or did I just ramble way too fast in my excitedness? That seems to have a lot of I get super geeked, so it can be, it can be tough sometimes. But makes sense. Yeah, these things like you can use the basic training isn't just the test to get into the school. The basic training is where you're going to get most of the skills from. The skills are things that come naturally when you get a critical mass of experience with the basics. So again, um, if a person has never pursued an athletic uh, endeavor, has never studied martial arts, does not physically train, it's gonna be a lot harder to explain some of these concepts we've, we've touched on in this video to that person. But, I can touch on concepts with you guys because you're all experienced and you know, at least know what I'm talking about. If you don't actually, you know, if you didn't have that, aha, I can do that too. I've had that experience type of motion. You at least have a sense of what we're talking about. here. So you can use, you can use the keyword um, concept to tie it all back together. You can use the keyword concept to teach people any level of information in a martial art. You can use it just to teach them about stances. Xing Yi has two eight character lists. It has the eight character skills, Ba Zi Gong. Those are fighting applications. Um, Xing Yi's version, you know, we, like we mentioned some of the 12 characters from Mantis, some of them were techniques, some of them were principles. Xing Yi has a list of eight that's just techniques, tactics, basically. Xing Yi has another Bazi, another eight character, the eight character secret. That's all about structure and standing in Santi share. Eight words about how you arrange your body to get the energy development aspect of the practice. So you can use it a lot of different ways. It's a very flexible concept. It's great for, you know, bring in an experienced martial artist up to speed with new techniques and strategies, take in somebody who's kind of in a journeyman position and getting them to a place where they can, they can have the confidence and competence to continue their martial arts development and teach themselves. Or you could take a complete raw newbie, turn some goofy useless fuck into an actual man that you can do something with. So there are a lot of, it's a, it's a very, fun concept to say the least i don't know if you guys uh are going to be as geeked about it as i am but you know i really this is one actually my favorites i wanted to do this episode for a long time because the key words are it's right there they're key it's key so thoughts reactions questions comments stories anything Talking about rebound energy, um, inspiring sessions. At least, at least once, I have, I have hit someone else, and after the session, I had long-term shoulder joint pain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so when, yeah, and uh, at least I've had boxers over time myself also develop tendonitis from rare hand strikes. Yeah. Um, develop uh, knuckle pain so quite when you say energy rebound it's something that is extremely extremely critical I think apart from one of the things that I I noticed has helped is bag work yeah especially without hand wraps or gloves so yeah. barehanded bag work because then 
the bag doesn't lie. If you hit it wrong or you don't manage the energy or you don't have the strength to take the rebound, mm. the bag hurts you. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, you and again, it's one of those self-paced things. You can hit it just as hard as you want to. So it's also something I coach people up to, like, you want to hit the bag, okay, if, if you're just starting, of course, hand wraps and gloves, but over time, you yeah. have to hit it with your own hands and then just hit it just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until yeah. you start getting better at hitting it, then you can hit it very strong. Yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. Um a lot of Chinese martial arts specifically forbid bag work because not enough people appreciate the progression that it requires. It it's so easy. It's literally a simple thing. You just but a, a, a raw newbie is not going to be in a position to do that. They can't make a proper fist. They can't throw a proper punch. They have no body method. They have no waist. They have no balance. Their root is not, you know, a million different problems. It's pick which one you want to address first for a beginner. But when you get a little more experience in, as Tommy said, yeah. And I do also, I also prefer no wraps or gloves or anything for a heavy bag. I've avoided using that kind of stuff for as long as I've been able to, you know, I don't have access to one right now, but, um, in the past, it's great. And it, it's perfect for testing your mechanics when you don't have another person to help test your mechanics. So those, those structural tricks that martial arts performers like to use, um, you know, you've seen the guys with the spear and they stab themselves in the throat and they press all their weight on it or they put the brick on their head or their crotch and another guy breaks it with a sledgehammer and nothing happens. Like, some of that is conditioning. Some of that is real literal skill. You know, iron shirt skill, a higher level version of what we were talking about earlier where the teacher beats you, where the teacher slaps you. Um, but some of them are also just physics, you know? Laying on the nail bed. That's not kung fu. That's fucking physics. So uh, you, you can use a heavy bag to get a physics-based test on your own mechanics and structure. And that's the great thing about it. I don't need, like, otherwise, if I don't have a bag, I need another person. I need you to come and pull my shoulder to try and uproot me to see if my body is distributed correctly. I need you to push on this part to see if, you know, if, uh, if, I'm, if I've got a... Uh, position like this, like a like a the mantis uh, hook hands or Bagua's triangle hands. If I'm doing this sort of thing and my shoulder isn't in the right position, even if it looks like it's settled, but it's not really settled. I'm not sure how much of a difference that was, but you know, a lot of people think that this kind of position is correct, but this is uh, about a half inch out of the socket. It's not as bad as this, but it's still not as good as this. So if I do this and one of you tries to lift my elbow, it's not going anywhere because of structure. But if I do this and one of you tries to lift my elbow, the whole thing's going right up. Most people, yeah. you know, they, they train uh, structure until it looks the way they think it should look, not until it does what the structure should do based on physics, based on basic mechanics, based on basic attack and defense. So heavy bag is a good way to do that. You find out, like, like you mentioned, people with uh, shoulder problems uh, from coming, you know, coming with their, uh, their rear hand. If your mechanics aren't perfect yet, you can drive it with the waist, great. But if you don't have that shoulder sunk down to attach to the body, you may be using your fist to hit them but you're really splitting the force, 50% into their face, 50% into your shoulder, if you're lucky, because it'll probably be something different and a lot less favorable. The less refined mechanically, the more likely there's going to be a rebound like that. Like, that's a real easy way to understand a rebound, but, you know, a 1% rebound, a 5% rebound, that can be a, a, a game changer, too. You can cripple somebody with that. You know, when, you, when it comes to the spinal cord, you know, all it takes is just a little bit of force at just the right angle and 
that can be it. Spinal damage, nerve damage, you're done. So these things are really important. These little tiny details are really important things to kind of, you know, it's like you want to eat that morsel when the teacher gives it to you, basically. You know, some, some teachers aren't going to ever tell you those little details. Some people will, you know, like I used to do. I'd say it, and then I wouldn't tell somebody how to get from where they were to what I was hinting at. Now I prefer to just sort of, hey, you want to see something cool? And then you do something fucked up to your friend, and then, all right, all right, all right, I'll buy your trust back by teaching you how to do it to the next sucker. I mean, to another attacker against you. So, comedy routines aside. The, the, big, the big benefit of keywords, one word, like lists of one or two words, real easy to remember. Because it's so nebulous and open-ended, you can put a lot in there. Training concepts, application concepts, specific techniques, the philosophy of the style, the, maybe the ethos of the style, you know? Um, You can, ex there's a lot of versatility to be had with the keyword format. So um, that's my final piece there on that. Thoughts, comments, any more questions? We can keep that part going. Excuse me. So now nah, we're good. All right. Well, this has been the Kung Fu Discussion Group, episode 12. As always, I am your Uncle Sickness, your favorite Kung Fu uncle. With me, as always, Yoga Midnight, the Magister, Mako. Gentlemen, build up your Kung Fu. I, I hope this was a productive conversation. Yep. All right. Thank see you. you all next time. Next time. Stupid. No good. With no talent. You shouldn't talk like that. We can fix your problem very quickly.